So I want to welcome you to our last meeting of the year. I'm Kathy Utiger, I'm your chair. And uh, do we have any people here who are, who are here for the first time? Ooh, goody. Do you have, are you new to tortoises? Do you have new tortoises? Okay, so if you have questions, be sure to ask somebody with one of these little badges or ask a question as we're going along. And uh, don't leave before you get all your questions answered, please. Um, let's see. I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on, and then one of the one of the things that we're having a problem with is the long-term placement of tortoises. Like, what are we going to do with all these tortoises that have come up? So let me go back and start with you all saw the news, and it it went viral, and boy, we were inundated with wonderful big-hearted people wanting to adopt, wanting to start a tortoise ranch and have 25 tortoises romping around on their acreage. Most of those people were not from Nevada. They were from New York and Washington State and here and there and just everywhere. The international grandmothers, everybody. So it was, it was very interesting how involved people were and they heard that all these tortoises were going to be euthanized. So let me tell you what I know of what's really happening. The Desert Tortoise Conservation Center is going to close in December of 2014, so a little more than a year from now. Now it may continue in a much reduced capacity as a research and training facility with maybe 200 tortoises under a different name if they can find the funding for that. It was never intended to be a place to hold pet tortoises. It just sort of morphed into that. And then they had this humongous problem of what to do with more than a thousand tortoises every year. Every year another thousand tortoises. And um, the funding, there wasn't funding to continue that type of program, so it had to be stopped. That's what stopped the pet tortoise problem. Now that's our problem, because we're the pet tortoise people. So people are still breeding their tortoises, and we're getting this humongous number of hatchlings every year. Half of, almost half of the tortoises picked up that go to the conservation center are hatchlings. Not quite, but almost half. So you know, you get a big male or female, but then you get a handful of hatchlings when you when you have to give them up. So they are working very hard at translocating the tortoises they have. They said they were at 1,400. Right now they're translocating tortoises to, is it El Dorado Canyon? Not, I don't think, well, wherever they're doing it. They're translocating them. This is the season to do it because, of course, it's not too hot and that way the tortoises have some time to find appropriate cover. They'll be able to do it again in the spring and again next fall in order to cut down so that they will not have on site any healthy tortoises. Now, unhealthy tortoises are treated. They have a large veterinary staff. They go through multiple rounds of antibiotics and if they can't, can't make the tortoise better, they're going to euthanize it. It's what they've done ever since the place started. Nothing new, but that E word, you know, came out and that just, the people said, oh, they're euthanizing thousands of tortoises. Well, they probably will have to euthanize some tortoises, but they're sick tortoises. They can't be put out in the desert and they can't be made better. So you have to make some kind of a decision. There is a small group of tortoises that is both healthy and can't be translocated. And those are tortoises that are either too large, they've decided over 12 inches is too large to put out into the desert. Well, a lot of our pet tortoises, you know, big boys, you know, they grow really big, especially when you want to feed them every day. So they, they figure that they're too large to go out there, that there won't be enough cover of the appropriate size. So 
those tortoises, some that are missing a partial limb or a whole limb, and a couple of others are available for adoption. So we're trying very hard to get those tortoises adopted, and I'm sure that by next this time next fall we'll have accomplished that. So that's where we are as far as I know. Questions? Yes, Mary. Do we have any doctors that did? Cut this, uh, do the secondary thing like they do on cats and dogs and things? Oh, <coughs> point number two on my list. Sterilization coming. Let's see, when was it? Spring, I guess it was. They sent, a, the, the tortoise center sent a group of eight, I think, males and eight females to Georgia to some folks to develop a technique for sterilization. That is finished and they're just wrapping up the protocols for those and hopefully very soon there, there will be some workshops to teach the local vets how to do sterilization. So actually another group is we've got those sterilized tortoises also available for adoption. Some females and a couple males. So that's kind of cool. Sterilized female. Yes. Now one of the tortoises he was recently adopted out was one of the sterilized males. And the family had a very large space and could accommodate the tortoise and they were very interested now that we have a sterilized male. Why could we not trust the female also? Is we can talk about that? Well, first of all, the Nevada state regulation that went into effect May first says one. No. And that so that's no. They can't have more than one. And just because it's sterilized doesn't mean that it's going to have a different kind of behavior. You know what boys are like. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that it's going to actually be mating with the female, but it's going to be out tearing around and um, possibly fighting and not mating, but that uh, I just actually talked with them about that. And, and uh, as far as we know, that's still not possible. Let me check on that. Tell them no. No, because the Nevada state regulation says no. It doesn't say for a sterilized one. But, you know, tortoises don't get along. They fight. But we'll, we'll have to see on that. The males and the females do fight a lot as well? Mm -hmm. Especially the males. Yeah. Now, maybe. We don't have any good studies on the non-sterilized ones, or the, sorry, on the sterilized ones to see if they fight also. Let me make a little note. I'll check with the higher-ups on that. Anything else? So yes, you're going to be able to get your critter sterilized, which is really cool. The big, big problem that we're all trying to solve is what are we going to do starting tomorrow, let's say, with the tortoises that are coming in to somewhere and we don't have any place to put them. People are saying, can't you guys have a big, huge fostering program, but nobody wants to start a little desert tortoise conservation center here and here and here where you have 10 tortoises here and 20 tortoises there and nobody to take them. So if anybody has any brilliant ideas, please let me know. Currently, what's happening is tortoises are taken to the Animal Foundation and when five or six of them build up there, they, the Desert Tortoise Conservation Center comes and picks them up and takes them there to the conservation center. When they hit 300 tortoises taken in for the year, they're going to stop. And they're not going to take any more, ever. Now, the Animal Foundation might, wow, might build up a, a, a small place to hold a few tortoises, but you know, you can only hold so many. So, we have a big problem and nobody wants to euthanize them, but the problem is exactly the same as that with, with cats and dogs, that there's a lot of breeding and uh, no place for them to go. So if you have any ideas, please let me know. 
I want to tell you about the vision committee. This is the committee that's formed of some folks who are helping to help Tortoise Group get up to the next level. We've worked on the mission statement and the vision statement and our goals and now we're working on our objectives and we're shooting forward and we are looking at advertising for an executive director maybe around November to start sometime in February. Have an office space. Pretty cool, huh? And then, hopefully, lots and lots of people will volunteer to help just a little bit so that we can get a lot done. Um, our next meeting is going to be March 22nd, 2014. We're going to switch back to the third Saturday of the week, a month. We've been doing it the fourth Saturday this year, but we're going to switch back in case you're ready to write all that down for next year. One of our big changes this year was moving to Mega Diet Reformulated. That's what RF stands for. Robert Furtek, you thought. Mega Diet Robert Furtek. Well. Really fine. Really fine. <laughs> Jessica Carroll designed a new plastic bag for us and we ordered 10,000 of those, which is the minimum order. And we had two Mega Diet baggings for a total of three tons. We have quite a lot in storage, so we're going to be well fixed to be starting the new year. We now offer the 10-pound sack, which is quite popular, especially online. And uh, the original Mega Diet is sold out for any of those that, those of you who are hoping to get some more, and there isn't any. About adoption. In spring, longtime life members Lee and Mary Parsons heard about the closure of the Pet Tortoise Pickup Service and the Conservation Center and wanted to take action. We discussed various possibilities and decided trying to stem the flow of tortoises to the Desert Tortoise Conservation Center through adoption was a good plan. The Parsons donated 200 shares of UPS stock for a value of more than $17,000. This allowed us to hire Janina Little to work for us to handle the adoptions. And so she's heading that committee and doing mega work. So recently, when the news came out about euthanasia, we've had quite a number of responses. Now, you'd think we'd have three or 400 or something, wouldn't you? But of course, that wasn't what happened. Um, Janina has handled almost all of these calls. And there have been maybe 50 or 70 of various varieties. However, we've only placed 13 tortoises so far. But there are another whole bunch of them in the pipeline coming along. It's amazing. Um, but there are a lot of people who have said, well, maybe we'll wait till next year or next spring or something. So hopefully, these tortoises will all get um, adopted. So I'm going to talk. Oh, there's Seymour. Oh. Now this doesn't exactly look by <clears throat> look like fall, but it was such a pretty picture. I just thought I would I would put it in. This is a little tortoise habitat, and then another one starts over here. Kind of pretty. So I want to talk about what's going on in fall and what has changed and what to expect and so on. So what's happened now? Your tortoise is browsing, hopefully, because it's perfect out and the tortoise is spending a lot of time out, probably pacing, maybe digging in the corner. Mine always digs in the corner at this time of year. You know, that's just preparing a little burrow for the winter. Of course, you're not going to let them stay there, but it's, <clears throat> it's what they're starting to do. And they're storing up food, and they're storing up water. Mine always wants to come inside. He says, I really need to come in. So he comes in. He wanders around for a while, and then I plop him back outside. Anyone else finding that? It's, it's OK if they come in. Oh, I let mine come in. Some people don't want to do that, I understand. So as the 
as fall proceeds, you're going to have the reverse of what we had in spring. It's going to start, get cooler, your tortoise will come out less and less, it'll eat less and less, and then you won't see them. It's really awful. You'd be like, what am I going to do now? Yeah, you're not supposed to have any. Oh, well, you will, though. So why do tortoises bromate? Well, you know, tortoises are cold-blooded animals. And in order to function, their bodies need to be about 85 degrees to metabolize the food, to run around and do all the tortoisey things they do. But when they can't warm up that much, they've got to have another strategy for survival. And that's to chill out. And so that's called brumation. Not all tortoises brumate. In this climate, they have to brumate. But their sulcatas and leopard tortoises, for instance, come from Africa, where the climate is different. And they don't brumate, even though they're here. Do you have those, Jim? Uh, he, can, he can tell us about that then. Because that's a whole different strategy for what you need to do. So what is brumation? Well, it's winter dormancy. So that's the fancy part of it. And of course, dormant means that not much is going on. So your tortoise is in there and it's just ticking over. Kind of like your car, just going but not running. It's just ticking over so that it's still alive. So it's physiological changes that are independent of body temperature, which is, we always think, well, it's getting colder, so my tortoise is going to roommate. But there, as I said, there's a lot more going on than that. The heart rate drops dramatically. The breathing slows to about four times per minute. And that's a pretty slow tortoise. So he's programmed, sorry, I say he, he's or she, is programmed to sleep and to not eat. Never they're really too cold to eat. So what do you do to get ready for brumation? Well, they're going to be in there for, let's say, November, December, November, December, January, February, no, four or five months anyway. So that's a long time for this little body to be ticking over and using up calories. So they need to have stocked up on some food because they'll be using up some of their stores and they're going to be breathing so they're going to be losing a little bit of moisture. Now one of the things they often do is they stick their little noses into a corner and they push the dirt up all around them so that they conserve as much moisture as possible and they don't lose very much. Well a big tortoise can lose some some moisture and it's not going to be life-threatening but a little guy like a little hatchling he can't lose very much so they're very careful to protect themselves so this feeding thing is a is a bit of a i think there's controversy about this some places on the web you'll will say don't feed your tortoise for a month before brumation and others say just go ahead and feed them so I figure let your tortoise do what he wants and let him just slow down at his own rate. It does take a long time for food to get through the tortoise's system and so you don't want to be pushing food on him if he doesn't think he can eat it. And you want to soak your tortoise a couple of times in a shallow pan of water. Now Tad doesn't like to be in there but when he was sitting down, oh, it was about this deep, or a little deeper. And then he plunked down there. They might drink for 20 or 30 minutes. And people always say, how am I going to know when my tortoise has had enough? Well, he started climbing out. They say, I have had it. Get me out of here. And uh, it's real clear. And a lady told me the other day that her tortoise goes into the water dish all the time. But she soaked him, and, and this tortoise sat there for 20 or 30 minutes. So I thought, well, that's interesting. Very, so 
give them extra stores to, so that they'll be ready for the long haul in the winter. Okay, what else? Boy, this is a huge amount of the original Meganite for this tiny tortoise. When is your tortoise going to brumate? Well, we all, we just talked about that. They're going to brumate when they figure it's time. You'll see them less and less. This little tortoise, this is his brand new home. He just went in there. He was at Dean Allen, Dean Lamar Allen School, and they had no one who would care for him. We just put him in there last spring, and now the new principal came in and they swapped around the teachers and there was no one who would care for this tortoise. So we had to find him a new home. So there he is in his new home. Lamar. Where should your tortoise be made? Now people will say, my tortoise is fine, I put him in the closet, or I put him under the bed, and that's really not the best place. He should be outside in his burrow where the temperature really is between 35 and 50, which seems awful cold to us. We want to put a blankie around our tortoises, you know, and let him snuggle. Well, that's not what a tortoise needs. He needs the burrow that's going to stay at the right temp and retain his moisture. And I already talked about this a little bit, but if he's inside, he's going to be doing a slow bake. He's going to He's going to be losing moisture and losing calories at a greater rate than he should be if he were outside. But sometimes you have to have a tortoise inside. Maybe you're doing construction in the backyard. Or maybe you just found this tortoise or something. Some reason why you have to, or the tortoise isn't well. That could be another thing. So if you have to have the tortoise inside, we uh, put it in a cardboard box with some dirt on the bottom, put it in a box in the garage, and put a thermometer there so that you can monitor it occasionally and check it out. If it's a little tortoise especially, put in a little lid of water. Otherwise, you, it might not make it through the winter. Just cover the box with a, a towel. Don't put a towel inside. They get their little nails stuck in that and then they get it all over. They put it over their heads and you don't need that, nor do they. So we have a, an information sheet on this on our website. This way. How long will my tortoise brew make? Well, only your tortoise knows. Most of them come out between early March and late April. Some outliers come out even in the end of February or not until May. Just incredible. But note that down because then you won't worry. And worry, worry, worry. That's what we want to try to avoid. So what can you do in winter? Now you don't get to feed your tortoise and look around for dandelions and stuff. So instead you can look for litter. That'll be, you don't want litter blowing into the, into the burrow, so. Mine kind of clogs up with, I guess the spiders make a spider web over the front and then there are little pieces of stuff that get on there, so there's a nice little barrier, kind of. But this, I, last year I decided to do this, we had such a cold January and windy, and I could just see the wind whipping across the front of the burrow and pulling out any warmth that was in there. So I thought, well, I'll do this. I just wadded up a piece of newspaper and I taped it up so it would stay in that shape and just shoved it in there. So it's just lightly there and the, there's still some air. And then rain. You know, sometimes it rains and rains and rains. Beginning of December, we often have a week of rain. And so it sort of builds up and the the soil becomes saturated and then that can lead to problems. So, well, I don't have my picture there, do I? If the burrow collapses, what did I put back here? If, the tor if it's flooded, if it collapses, dig that thing up, even if it's raining out there. 
because that tortoise is in jeopardy down there. I've had people call me and say, my burrow's flooding, what should I do? Well, just get out there with a shovel or call some people who can help you to dig it up because the tort tortoise maybe can hold his breath for a while, but chances are it could be real tough. Now, if the, if the burrow gets dry or all wet in there, you're gonna have to open it up and dry it out. And this would be one of those times when you'd need to bring the tortoise in and put it in a box in the garage. And then when it gets dry, build it back up. Just slip the tortoise back in so that it can wake up naturally in its burrow. If your tortoise is sick right now, <clears throat> It may be too late to treat it, and maybe not. I'm about to take Lamar to the vet on Monday, so I'll be very interested to see what she says. Um, I've had a little drippiness on my tortoise, and because he has hurts and he breaks with it, hasn't in years, but sometimes he gets a little drippy, and then when he comes out in, in the spring, it's all gone. And a lot of people, uh, tell us that that does happen, but if a tortoise is really sick, you might not want to take that chance. And sometimes a very sick tortoise needs to be kept up during the winter. So various things if you have a tortoise that's ill. Now if your tortoise comes out in January or February on one of those really nice days, you know, it's sunny and it feels like it's about 85, and the tortoise might come out, well, he's still brumating. So don't bother feeding him because we've still got a long stretch of cold. Just say hi and let him go about his business and then, and then he'll go back. So they may come out when it rains or when it's warm. Just let him go. That's a treat, huh? A person treat. Now here's this little barrier that's a, a fun way to find out if you're tortoise has come out because, of course, you're never there when they come out in spring. You know, you're looking and looking. So you can put up this little barrier of Q-tips and then they'll knock it over if they come out. Of course, you might, if you have cats and rabbits and other stuff that go in there, well, that's not going to work. Maybe you'd have to have a, something else. But that's one little way. So just to review, soak your tortoise. Oh. I messed that up, huh? Let your tortoise decide how much to eat. It, may, it might be a lot or nothing at all. And then mark the last day you see it. And then in spring, just the opposite. Your tortoise will come out March to April or May. You'll start basking to warm up because it's going to take a while. Let them stay. They may stay out because it's warmer out than it is in the burrow. And when they start cruising around, give them mega diet. We're going to get started. Um, we're going to uh, make this a quick introduction because we are short on time. This is Jim Moore from the Nature Conservancy. Thank you very much. I forgot to give uh, Manny my, my bio. I'm supposed to prepare one. It's in the car. Um, but in the interest of time, just uh, suffice to say that uh, I was one of uh, two people that opened the Nevada Office of the Nature Conservancy in 1990, and uh, have been working with uh, desert tortoise issues with Clark County um, habitat conservation planning process initially, and then um, moved into uh, the uh, uh, community-based conservation world, working in the Oasis Valley in Beatty. Nevada and Nye County with the uh, wetland protection and preservation for the Amargosa Toad, Oasis Valley Speckled Dace, and uh, some spring snails that are found only in that valley. Um, and that, that was a really good, uh, it has been a good project and is ongoing to this day. Um, I've also worked internationally in Indonesia and Mongolia and Africa over the years on various conservation projects. So. Just a little bit of background, and now I'm working with uh, closely with the Nevada and uh, California chapters of the Nature Conservancy, trying to influence the siting and the mitigation of uh, large-scale renewable um, energy uh, facilities, industrial-scale uh, renewable energy facilities, because 
Up until um, 2010, the uh, Bureau of Land Management and uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and many other land managers were getting inundated by applications for renewable energy, primarily solar initially. Um, solar, large-scale solar facilities, and then they had no idea how to process those. They were getting applications stacked four and five on top of each other. In case one fell out, the next one would then take, be considered, and the next one. And this was very much like the early gold rush years. People were doing it solely on speculation. Goldman Sachs was a big investor in this, and they were only they were buying and selling these things like like uh, stock. Um, it was a really uh, interesting time, very hectic, and as a result of that, uh, the Nature Conservancy was very concerned that the Mojave Desert was essentially going to get eaten up alive by this uh, reno renewable energy push. Because it sounds so good in, to the general public, it's green, it's you know countering uh, carbon-based pollution, carbon-based uh, energy production. Uh, there was little... There are very few voices that were saying, wait a minute, stop, let's, let's look at this thing, let's, let, let's evaluate it. What is it really doing to the environment where these things are being built? And where are they being built? Where are they being proposed to be built? Um, all of these questions weren't being asked initially. It was just a gold rush, literally, of a land rush of uh, companies, newly formed companies, subsidiaries of companies, you name it. And they're all trying to get in on the solar rush. And because of that, uh, the Conservancy uh, California chapter invested uh, $300,000 of its own money to do a, an evaluation of the Mojave Desert so that we could more intelligently respond to the question of, well, if not here, then where? And so we knew that there were some places that were very bad for, for building these things, but we didn't. what we didn't know was where the best places are that, that exist in the Mojave Desert, where you could build it with very little conflict, and that's why we entered into this process. And I'll go through the boring stuff initially, just to let you know the steps that we took to uh, do this evaluation so that you know it wasn't just you know me with a crayon drawing on a, a map uh, saying okay look, go here don't go there it was very systematic very science-based pro process um, you know in the interest of time I'll gloss over some of this but uh, so why is, is solar appearing in the Mojave Desert it's the highest degree of insulation that is solar um, exposure in the United States it's the least developed of all the continental ecoregions uh, more, there's more space to build. Most publicly owned lands of any ecoregion in the United States, so they don't have to buy the land. They simply lease it from the Bureau of Land Management for a you know, 20, 30 year period, uh, much cheaper than buying it. And industrial scale solar um, allows for consolidation of control and output of energy by the utility company. So the utility companies really like this because they can get their arms around it, they can control it. Um, as you'll find out later in, in the um, presentation, uh, they're very much opposed to what we call distributed generation right now because they can't control it. So rooftop solar, parking lot solar, things like that. Um, so as, uh, this is no surprise to you guys uh, living here, but public lands management is a, a wealth of conflicts. Um, varying degrees of, of interest groups that are trying to um, use the same amount of land, whether it's for wilderness, uh, historical cultural preservation, uh, sand and gravel mining, off-road vehicles, um, racing, uh, and the effects that that causes on some of these areas in the desert, as well as uh, species protection like the, for the desert tortoise. And all of this is occurring on, the, on virtually the same uh, landscape and so balancing these uses and these these demands on public land is a real challenge for the land management agency and now add to that the uh, the growing demand for uh, renewable energy production and that's that's created a whole new dynamic that nobody saw coming in 2008 2009 um, and this is really the new, I mean, back then we were worried about more housing developments, another, you know, Coyote Springs Valley or another Rhodes Ranch or Blue Diamond Hill being developed. Um, we didn't foresee that these huge multi-thousand acre uh, developments would be coming in. 
And so what we did was we looked at the entire Mojave Desert uh, ecoregion. Uh, it exists in four states, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, California, with about half in California and the other biggest chunk in Nevada. And we divided that up into uh, six sections, six sub-regions that, that are reflected by the uh, floristic uh, patterns. So Joshua Tree uh, communities are different here than they are here. You can see some of those uh, down when you're traveling uh, between LA or San Diego and Las Vegas. You see the Joshua Trees are very different going from Las Vegas to Riverside, for instance. They get much more robust, long leaves, huge, you know, 25, 30, 50 foot tall. Um, and so that based on uh, published uh, records of where those floristic patterns existed, as well as desert tortoise genetic units, we divided the entire ecoregion into six regions, primarily so that we could make sure that for all the things that we were trying to capture in the Mojave Desert, that we're capturing representatives within each of these regions to reflect the, the genetic diversity that's in, inherent in this ecoregion as you go from south to north or east to west. Because um, everything is different on the edges of these uh, of these ecoregions. And so, again, not to bore you with this, but what we did was we identified the targets, so uh, species targets, everything. Flowers, plants, uh, trees, uh, insects, anything for which there is published data and published information. Um, we set quantitative goals for each target for those things that were really rare, like devil's hill pupfish, 100%. I mean, obviously, you can't go anywhere else to get it. For things like Las Vegas bear poppy, which is only found in a narrow band in North Clark County going into uh, the northern Arizona, uh, we set a very high goal for that, 90% of the, the population locations for that. And that's so what we're trying to do is accomplish conservation of the most rare and limited range things, as well as capturing representatives representatives of those things that are more widespread, uh, ironically like desert tortoise. Um, it's throughout the entire ecoregion, it's in the Sonoran as well as the Mojave, even though there's, there's two different populations, two different species now recognized. Um, and so we set goals for each of those targets, and then we characterize the land uses uh, the land use impacts such as roads, urban areas, agricultural uses, used a computer program to help identify and map where the best places to capture as much of this with as little land as possible. So getting the most bang for your buck. And that we had to use a computer program because it can run millions of different iterations, different combinations in a very short period of time that we can't do on our own head. Um, and then we used, uh, we attributed high conservation value to those areas with low levels of disturbance and unique or high concentrations of our conservation targets. And this resulted in a map that um, was broken into four categories, ecologically core, these are the areas, I'll show you in the next one. Oh, first of all, the entire um, 32 million acres of the Mojave Desert was broken into 640 acre mile, 640 acres a square mile. These are not squares, obviously, these are uh, hexagons, and that's because everything that it touches is an, is an equal edge. With a square, you can't have equal edges because they, the corners touch um, another thing. So it, it, you can't really design something with a square that you can with a hexagon. Uh, not not uh, surprisingly, you know, bees have figured that out a long time. <laughs> this is the most efficient way to uh, construct something. Um, and so uh, what we did was we looked at each of these, there are 53,000 of these in the entire Mojave Desert. So we looked at each one from satellite imagery and we evaluated how, how much conversion or disturbances are already on there. And for those that are ecologically intact, you can see there's very little visible, if any. For those that are moderately degraded, it may be converted in something like this, like a golf course is the Laughlin area. Um, but golf courses are very usable by wildlife, and they, you can still pass through them, and eventually, if they get abandoned, they can return to some semblance of a natural um, uh, ecosystem. But then you get these uh, hard, what we call highly converted, hard development uh, zones, and if they're 25% or more, they've received the highest or the worst category, categorization. 
So the result of that is this entire uh, ecoregion was was categorized into these zones. And the way the best way to read this at kind of at a glance is these these dark green areas are the areas that absolutely should be protected because they contain the the bulk of what it is that makes the Mojave Desert different than the Sonoran Desert, different than the Great Basin Desert or the Sierra uh, Sierra Range. So if you can conserve or protect all of the green area, you're going to do a very good job in protecting everything that is that makes the Mojave um, unique. The light green areas are those areas that are ecologically intact, and so they're the least amount of degradation. They support the dark green areas because you can't have islands sitting out there with um, with threats all around it uh, because eventually it gets degraded and, uh, over time. So a good way to think about this is with a chocolate chip cookie, the, the chocolate chips need the cookie to support it. So these green areas are the chocolate chips and the, the cookie is the ecologically intact areas. The orange areas are those things that are uh, moderately degraded. So here you have Fort Irwin, a uh, heavy um, tank tra training area. Here, you know, obviously the you know, Sandy Valley, um, Pahrump Valley gets uh, dark red, highly converted, Las Vegas Valley, Laughlin, Needles, um, and then uh, Riverside, uh, Barstow. Uh, so you can see that this is a, it's quite a bit more green than I would have expected. And many people look at the Mojave Desert nowadays and think, well, it's pretty much, you know, I hear from a lot of people, it's pretty much trashed by off-roaders, by people, you know, throwing trash out, the, out their window or behind their development. Um, but in, in fact, it's, there's actually 86% of the Mojave Desert is either ecologically core or ecologically intact. And the lower conservation value is 14%, with 10% moderately degraded, the orange stuff, and only 4% highly converted. So this is one of the least converted or least uh, degraded ecoregions of all of the 48 continental state, which is surprising. Um, so the ownership then, that's another important factor. Who manages these lands? So for the ecologically core lands, those are the most important. Um, BLM owns about 45% of it. Not surprising since they're the largest landowner. National Park Service, Department of Defense, and then private. The, uh, the combination of the core and ecologically intact is pretty much the same ratio. Uh, you get you know, BLM, Park Service, DOD, and then private. So these are the par partners we have to work with closely to make our goal happen. This is how we identify who it is that we actually have to be working with on a daily basis or weekly, talking with our partners, making sure that they have the same information at hand when they make these decisions as to where they're going to cite these things, what kind of land uses they're going to allow in the desert. Uh, so the highly converted lands, again, no surprises, private, 85%, and then and so on. So our conclusions are: it's one of the it's very rich in conservation value and one of the least fragmented of the ecoregions. We've identified about 4.5 million acres that's moderately degraded or highly converted. This is where these installations should be going: parking lots, old agricultural fallow fields, uh, military training uh, lands that are no longer needed for to meet the uh, uh, military mission. Um, and, and from the industry standpoint, these are the areas, this is really important, that are likely to have fewer environmental constraints for development. So if they're looking for to get their project on the ground quickly with the least amount of resistance, with the least amount of permitting, the least cost in terms of mitigation, these are the lands they should be going to. So we're not only uh, putting this information in the hands of the land managers, we're putting it in the hands of the developers. We've been working with several uh, developers, Bright Source, uh, Solar Millennium. Some of these things have gone bankrupt since since we've begun the discussion, but we're going to keep talking with whoever will listen to us. <laughs> um, nothing showed. Oh, sorry. Okay, so when I talk about re renewable energy, what is it that we're talking about? There's many different types of renewable. Uh, one thing that's uh, gaining in popularity are called these solar power towers. And this is what you see in Ivanpah Valley as you travel south on I-15. This is in Israel. It's a different uh, configuration than the one in, in Ivanpah. But basically it involves 
uh, mirrors, what they call heliostats, which track the sun and aim it at a central tower, which uh, heats up um, either molten salt or some other liquid configuration that then goes down, uh, heats water, creates steam, turns a turbine, and generates electricity that way. Um, they've gotten around some of the uh, economic uh, limitations because when the sun goes down, it doesn't generate electricity. They, by using molten salt, which they can heat up to, I, I believe it was about 1300 degrees um, Fahrenheit, um, they can store that molten salt at that temperature and keep generating steam all night long. So it, it's more efficient uh, that way. Um, this old, older technology, um, the solar troughs uh, technology, which had, um, it's basically a parabolic mirror which focuses sunlight on a pipe going down the center of each of these tubes. This uses a lot of water. This uses about this uses about a tenth or less of the amount of water this uses because each of these pipes is generating has water running through them and is generating steam um, and turning turbines to generate electricity. It's also very land intensive. Uh, this is called the Stirling engine, which uses essentially a, this kind of scenario miniaturized. So all these little mirrors focus on this one central thing that converts the energy on, into electricity and then sends it off. And then, of course, photovoltaic panels like you see at uh, UNLV. They have two of these um, by a company that uh, also went bankrupt. So there's a lot of speculation, a lot of investment, and a lot of failure that goes along with. Uh, I'll take a question. Oh. Well, the, the bottom left is called um, this one here. Those are called solar trough or concentrating solar, um, CSP, concentrating solar power. Um, but we call them just power troughs or solar troughs. And you see this falling out of favor because, especially in the Mojave, because of its amount of water use. It's tremendously water wasting. Okay, and then wind is the is the new one that's really catching on, especially on the edge of the Mojave Desert, on the uh, western edge of the Tehachapi's, um, and uh, again, very a lot of fragmentation associated with the roads that are used to install these. These are huge towers. Um, they're finding these uh, these uh, engines that are turning these things, or that are uh, being turned by the the fan blades. Um, are catching fire quite quite regularly, in addition to uh, killing many migratory birds, raptors, bats. And so the thing that really brought home to me the fact that we need to do a better job of citing these things is Ivanpah Valley. To me, this represents the worst case scenario of bad decision making, uh, rushed decisions with poor information. Uh, this was, um, just uh, east of uh, I-15 on the eastern side, across from uh, Prim, um, on the same side as the Prim Golf Course. And this is, you're looking at 3,500 acres of what was equivalent to old growth Mojave Desert uh, ecosystem. Uh, very old Joshua trees, Mojave, Mojave yuccas, creosote rings, uh, desert tortoise population was much more dense than they, they had anticipated at first. They had an initial take permit for this uh, project at about, was, I've heard anywhere from 32 to 38 tortoises were allowed to be removed. And in just developing this, they, they took off 127. So they had to stop reevaluate, reassess uh, phase two and phase three, and uh, get a higher permit take from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which they did get. And now they can remove several hundred. Um, it, it, initially, they were going to just take the tortoises off here and move them off into the, the neighboring uh, territory, because their initial assumption was that this was low-density tortoise habitat. Uh, it turns out it's much more high density than they anticipated, and so relocating the tortoises to the outside is actually going to end up crowding the resident tortoises because they're existing at a at a rate that's essentially a saturation. You can assume based on the what the natural resources are producing. All right. Sorry. This is what uh, green energy looks like. That's, that's a 
say Mojave Yucca is several hundred years old. Yeah. Being ground down to sawdust. Maybe it could have come from the walls of the Oh. So that's what they did to the entire 3,500 acres. They didn't blade it like most other renewable energy uh, developments have done. But they did this, and I don't want to do this. And you'll see a, a several hundred year old uh, cap, uh, barrel cactus right here that's already been here. So we just did that on the entire site. So just to kind of, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, there you go. There's, when I speak to students about green energy and renewable energy, I make sure they see that just to make sure to put it in perspective, what does it really mean? All they're thinking about is the trade-off between coal and renewable energy. They don't think what's happening on the ground. Uh, so uh, thank you for bearing with me on that one. But this, this will give you a good idea of, of the extent of the development plan in Ivanpah Valley. Here's I-15 uh, south, going through the Ivanpah Dry Lake. Uh, this is the 3,500-acre um, Ivanpah Ivanpah uh, generating system that we just saw. Uh, this is Silver State North and South that are being in the final stages of development. Silver State uh, North has already been built. This is photovoltaic. Silver State South is being uh, planned right now. And this is all high density tortoise habitat. And the Fish and Wildlife Service is making the case that tortoises from Ivanpah Valley need to communicate with the tortoises up here in the Jean Lake uh, Roach Lake area. Um, if they build out this, there's, they're going to cut them off completely, and so this population will eventually uh, die out. This is where the large-scale translocation site is, where something like 9,000 tortoises over the past 20-something uh, years have been relocated uh, off of developing areas in Clark County, in Las Vegas Valley. This is Prim, and uh, this is another uh, approved and to be built a uh, solar project uh, state called state line solar this is the existing print golf course just to put you give you perspective you know, this is about one square mile right here and these are you know several times larger than that so this is the type of threat that we're facing and we have to find a better way to do this a better way of operating these things uh, and a better way of making the siting decision just to give you an idea of, uh, let me go back, this one right here, just to give you an idea of the relative size of that, this is that facility laid over the city of San Francisco. So it's, they're enormous facilities. So the alternatives to Mojave Desert just, uh, destruction are distributed generation, energy conservation, degraded sites redevelopment, and something called urban solar farms, which is gaining ground right now. Um, distributed generation means basically, you know, build it wherever it, you have an open space um, that's already developed, uh, parking lots, rooftops. What's the one premium that you always look for when you go shopping in Las Vegas? Shade. Why are we not doing this? <laughs> Why is this only in very few spots like the Las Vegas Springs Preserve? Um, yeah, every Walmart, every mall, every you know uh, condo or apartment complex should have these. Generate the energy on site, close to where it's being used, and provide shade for the residents. It's a win-win-win-win <laughs> with with no um, you know no losses other than the utility companies don't like it because they can't control it. They can't control the price. They can, they can't control the amount of energy. And to be fair, these things do generate. Um, electricity in, in different pulses throughout the day and the existing transmission lines there the utility companies say can't handle this unpredictable load and so you know, I don't understand everything about energy um, generation and, and transmission we're, we're trying to get up to speed on that so we can talk more intelligently about it but this just makes all the sense in the world and MGM Grand just recently um, uh, made the announcement that they're going to uh, cover more than 20 acres of existing facilities, uh, Cedars, not MGM Entertainment, M MGM uh, uh, Casino Group. So this, you know, they should be getting an award from the city, from the state, for doing that. And then, of course, rooftop solar on houses. 
uh, energy conservation, there's estimates that if they just, if uh, homeowners would just conserve the amount of energy they use now, it would more than make up for what is being planned in terms of uh, renewable energy developments in the desert. So that there's doing these things like home insulation, double paned windows, smart metering, smart energy meters, or controls in home where you can shut the lights off and then set the temperature lower or higher when you're not in the house. That kind of stuff will more than make up for the amount of energy generated from these off-site facilities. And then the repair or upgrades of existing transmission lines. Um, a lot of power is lost when it's transmitted thousands or hundreds of miles across, uh, across the cities. And then generation close to the place of use, like I was talking about with the uh, rooftop and parking lot. Instead of building these things hundreds of miles out in the pristine desert and then having to transmit that energy back to uh, the local city, um, which requires a new road to be built, new transmission lines to be built, generate the, place, the energy close to its place of use. And uh, one thing that's required for um, uh, rooftop solar is this thing called net metering, which essentially uh, it, the utility company can either pay you up front for the installation. They're doing in Southern California this thing called uh, rooftop leasing, where they essentially pay for the, the construction of the of, um, roof, rooftop panels and they get all the electricity and, and you get, I think they can pay you some dividend every month or every year. There's a rebate to your energy use. The other way to do it is called um, uh, feed-in tariff, where you um, generate electricity, anything that you generate above and beyond what you use in your house, that the utility agrees to buy it back at a premium. So they buy it at, at more than what it costs you to generate. So eventually it, it, it pays it for itself over time. So just to show you the, the amount of growth in this industry in, in rooftop or residential and commercial photovoltaic, um, from 1998, the cost per unit, that is per watt of uh, energy produced was $12 in 1998, down to 2011, now it's in, in the you know, $6 and below range, depending on, on the size of the uh, installation. And this is all having a very good cumulative effect, of course. Very few um, photovoltaics uh, systems were installed in 98. Now, 2011, you're getting uh, quite a bit, and the cumulative impact now is uh, you know, 4,000 megawatts being produced by um, rooftop solar. So just in summary, uh, we have 4.5 million acres of degraded or converted land to build on. Energy conservation more than meets additional energy needs. Parking lots and rooftops are no-brainers from my perspective for solar installation. But the, the key and the trick to this is that energy companies need to incentivize and support distributed generation via net metering. Um, there's an uh, assembly bill in Congress right now in California where the uh, power companies are pushing to remove the financial incentive for building of distributed generation um, because they're finding it's hurting their business model. Um, so we need to turn that around somehow. And the way it gets turned around is by public participation, public input into these uh, public utility commission meetings. Um, so that's just a oblique way to make a pitch for participate in your uh, governance. <laughs> make sure that these energy companies, these utility companies, are working in your best interests completely all around from the environmental perspective as well as your pocketbook. That's it. Any questions? Yes. How come the, um, the solar industry, the, the companies are going out of business? They're going out of business um, for a variety of reasons. One, there is a lot of misunderstanding of what it means to build these things in the, in the desert. For instance, a colleague of mine that you may know, John Hyatt, who uh, leads the Red Rock Audubon Society, or he did, um, went with, on a tour out with a, a solar company to the Amargosa Desert where they were planning to, to build a, a large photovoltaic panel um, facility. And as they were walking, you know, this is completely surrounding a sand dune. So, you know, these guys are coming from Germany, from, from Washington or New York, and they've got no concept of how the desert operates. 
John Hyatt bent down, picked up this bottle that had been sandblasted completely smooth to this unrecognizable lump of, of uh, glass. And he said, see this? This used to be a Coke bottle. This is what your solar panels are going to look like in 10 or 20 or 30 years. They're going to get sandblasted. And that totally took them by surprise. They didn't understand sand dunes and arts are not static things. They're dynamic. They require sand to be blown up to constantly resupply them as those sand rolls away. And anything built in that corridor is going to get sandblasted. So there are four or five projects that were planned around that big dune area in the Amargosa Valley that have since disappeared because they can't get the funding. Another uh, issue of why they go bankrupt is they didn't do their calculation right in terms of they may have had the funding to build the thing, what they didn't have was the agreement from the utility company to buy their energy produced. It's called a purchase, power purchase agreement. Without that power purchase agreement, you're dead in the water. Unless you've got a, you know, a, a human uh, community built right there next to your solar plant and you're supplying the, the electricity to that community, no one's going to buy your power. So you've, you've built something that nobody wants. And that's why they, many of them have gone that way. And the other reason is, uh, for many of these Goldman Sachs um, facilities that were planned, it was just pure speculation. It was that whole gold rush mentality. Let's get out there, let's get our applications in, no matter what, we'll figure it out later. They couldn't get, get their act together. Yeah. So NV Energy doesn't want to participate or buy a power from NV, NV Energy does not. All, all the power being generated by these large facilities you see are going to California. It's going to Southern California because they've got a higher, uh, what's called the, um, Renewable Production Standard, RPS. Um, they've got 30% goal by 2020, I think it is, or 2015. Um, ours is something like 20 or 25% by 2020, and we've already met it based on uh, a lot of geothermal energy production up north. Um, the, the, I'm blanking on them. There are several other um, facilities that have already been built and are already up and running. Oh, the El Dorado Valley. Um, solar plants um, but m many of these new ones are being built so to supply for California uh, energy needs because it's easier to get permitted in Nevada the laws are lax the environmental regulations are much less than they are in California so they can build these things in Nevada and send the power hundreds of miles across the desert to California each one of these is something like three or four row, uh, rows of mirrors within each of these tracks um, I think it's 170 something thousand mirrors in the three facilities. Um, but this is the heart of Ivan. This is the Ivanpah Valley. This is its heart. Just, it's been cut out by this development. And you know they're planning another. That other one is going to go right here. So I mean, this is we're using this as the poster child for bad decision making on it for a good what could be a good project if it were cited correctly. And so uh, my message from the Nature Conservancy is we're not in opposition to renewable energy, we're not in opposition to industrial scale renewable energy, just not in pristine desert habitat. And we've done your job for you, you the industry, and you BLM and you Fish and Wildlife Service, we've identified the areas for you, now use it. You know, we've invested $300,000 of, of our own money to identify these areas, now use that good information that should help in fast-tracking these projects. That's it. Thanks so much. So, everybody, let's do one more round of applause for Jim Moore. to answer any other questions you guys have. Jim, also as a thank you, um, we have tortoise group t-shirts. We'd like to give you one if you want to pick out a size. And um, Kathy, do we have any more auction stuff to I, I, I think I'm looking all about that. Is there anybody else who would like to answer or not?
Thank you all for coming. And uh, if you've got questions, be sure to ask them, and we'll see you. See you next year when you come out of rotation.